Today, I'm honored to be joined by Kevin Kelly. In 1971, Kevin dropped out of the University of Rhode Island after only one year, and he would go on to become an independent photographer in some of the most remote parts of Asia. And this was only the beginning of Kevin exploring some of the most incredible curiosities that this world has to hold. He is co-founder and senior maverick of Wired Magazine. He is co-chair of the Long Now Foundation, as well as being an author of several highly regarded books, such as New Rules for the New Economy, What Technology Wants, and many more. Today, we're here to discuss his new book, Excellent Advice for Living, Wisdom I'd Wish I'd Known Earlier. And let me tell you, this covers a wide array of topics, such as optimizing your curiosity, optimizing your generosity, and optimizing your love. Today, we sit down to discuss how Kevin's been able to maximize the joy in his life and how he was able to put all the wisdom he's learned throughout his life right into this book. And let me tell you, this book is an incredible read. You're reading through this book and you're seeing a bunch of parables, which are short little phrases all put together. It's almost like you're reading a book of tweets. But let me tell you, you can spend hours just looking at one tweet and really taking in the wisdom that comes with it. He has an incredible gift for taking a wide concept and being able to condense it down. And I can't recommend this book enough. You're really going to enjoy this one. I can't thank Kevin enough for joining me for today. He's such an incredible person, and this was a really special conversation. If you enjoyed today's conversation and you want to see even more incredible conversations going forward, please follow along and leave a rating wherever you may be consuming this show. It really is the best way to help grow the show, and I can't thank you enough for being a support. Thank you for tuning in to the R20s podcast. Without further ado, Kevin Kelly. I've heard you talk a lot about how when kids are young, they listen to their parents, uh, but they don't truly understand what they're saying, and they might be paying attention, but it doesn't really click until later on in life. I certainly feel that same kind of way being 23. I certainly fail to listen to my parents a lot. And sometimes I'll have that aha moment. I'll be like, oh, that's what they meant. Did you have one of those moments that stuck out in your mind? Maybe it was from your parents or another adult figure that later on in life, it really clicked for you. And you're like, oh, that's what that meant at that time. A particular moment is not coming to mind right now um, where, you know, something my parents said, I... Mm -hmm. um, my my parents were not very like myself, not very preachy to us. Yeah. They yeah. they um I'm I'm trying to even remember uh any time when they kind of were trying to give us advice. Um it very rarely happened. Um but I, I certainly did pay attention to what my parents did, and I think that's yeah. my, one of my messages was um that you can uh parroting is I think you can be more effective in trying to act out and do rather than what you what you say Absolutely. so 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 no I, I wasn't really surrounded by very much advice growing up um, there were there were things later on in life when I was working with people that people said that did stick with me um, and maybe not even as you're suggesting immediately maybe I had to process it first Um but uh, when I was a kid, um, it was really funny because there because there wasn't much said. You know, we went to yeah. church and I listened to the sermons, and there was probably more effect on <laughs> listening to the gospels say, which had huge effect on me. Yeah. But um, my parents really weren't into that. Yeah. What I, what I admire a lot about your story is how free of a thinker you are. You quite literally have the title of senior maverick <laughs> with Wired. And to be a maverick, you have to be a free thinker and willing to go against the grain and go against certain principles. And you certainly went against a lot of principles uh, when you went off to college and you realized after a year that this is not exactly what you want to be doing. Uh, you have said multiple times that if gap years were a thing back in the day, that you probably would have taken one of them, uh, but that wasn't an option. <laughs> so you, you just said, all right, let's drop out. I don't want to be wearing a suit for the rest of my life. And you went off and you photographed Asia and you had some amazing experiences. And you were the one who had to give yourself permission to, as you would say in one of the parables, is taking a break is not a sign of weakness, but it's a sign of strength. You had to give yourself that permission to, to take that break. How do you do that? Because a lot of us, uh, being young people, can't mm -hmm. seem to find that strength within us to take that break. Mm -hmm. well, well, again, when I was young, I, don't, I didn't have a, very, a lot of um, self-awareness, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't like... Um, that I was deliberately planning my life. There wasn't. Uh, it wasn't as if I was um, had really any idea what I was doing, or that I was even aware. Yeah. In a certain sense, that I was um, giving myself permission. Um, I actually got the permission and the encouragement to do that from reading books, hmm. and um, <clears throat> I read about. Um, 
you know, scientists doing things and, you know, people who are explorers and who seem to buck the establishment. Mm-hmm. And maybe I got some of that. But it was also the era of the hippies. And so there was this whole thing of people who were chanting and seemed much more interesting to me who were, who were dropping out. So they were suddenly dropping out, even though I dropped out of college, that was not common, but dropping out of society and going to the alternative communes was a signal to me that it was possible. Mm-hmm. So maybe if I had been five years um, earlier, before the hippies, maybe that would have never occurred to me at all. <laughs> there would have been no role model at all. So yeah. by the time I graduated from high school and the whole earth catalog came on, where here was a here was a award winning publication that was sort of the Bible about the alternative lifestyle, about doing things. That to me was what I needed. That was the key. Yeah. Seeing that, seeing the role models, seeing what was possible, understanding that there were alternatives available. And so maybe that's part of the answer is is um, that permission is is having role models or, or or having people who have an alternative example can, that yeah. can show you that there is another way that is legitimate that they can succeed and stuff and so i think these days it should be pretty easy to believe that that's yeah. possible you know in the 50s and 60s it was really tough. I remember, I think I told the story, but I remember my dad had a friend who had a startup. And at that time, this would have been in the 60s, when you told someone that you were involved in a startup, that was code for you were unemployed. <laughs> That's very People true. People had true. pity on you, basically. There was, there was no, there was nothing cool about it whatsoever Mm -hmm. it was like you were you were a salmon going you know upstream it was you were you were going against the thing because it was the the dream was to work for the big corporation and the idea of starting your own and working off to the side and having very little resources it was like that's that's a that was a really um uncool way yeah. Um, and so, so now we have a lot more models. So for someone today who is finding it difficult to, um, to be open to that, I, I would say maybe, you know, investigate more what the possibilities are. Cause I think, um, I think enough people are doing things in an alternative way that you should be encouraged by that. Absolutely. And I think if you ask that question, four years ago, someone would say the term influencer, uh, that's big nowadays with young people, that would have been the version of unemployed. But now we've seen a trend where influencer is one of the most profitable um, professions that you can get yourself into. And it's in that alternative stream that's not necessarily in the traditional schooling system. And I think a lot of young people have been inspired by that. And they're trying to branch out and do these very niche type of topics, niche type of careers, because they see it is possible. And they have that mentor towards them. I think one of the best things is that your mentor doesn't necessarily need to know that you're their mentee, especially in today's technological age. You can view someone online and you can absolutely follow and emulate what they're doing. And in the 50s and 60s, I'm sure that was a bit harder. I know that just reading your story, it didn't sound like anyone in Westfield was that person for you. I know you've talked about like your track coach, Walt Clarkson. was He was a good guy, but he wasn't necessarily someone who inspired you to take that step and travel Asia. It's no. all about seeking and trying new things. And you are a big trier, which I love. You are constantly trying new things. No matter how minute it may seem, you're always trying to challenge yourself and put yourself into a new situation to just experience different things. How did you get into that mindset of wanting to try a lot? Because there's a lot of people who are content with just being at home, watching Netflix. <laughs> mm-hmm. And after a long day of work, they just want to chill mm-hmm. out, not do anything. But you're constantly trying to stimulate yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I I do chill out, so so I yeah. just w- want to be clear that um, I'm not a workaholic, really. In that sense. <laughs> yeah, I think the difference is is that I've engineered something so that what I do for work is what I do for play. So yeah. so it's I'm a playaholic, you could say, and so <clears throat> um, 
And, and, and by the way, I mean, that's another piece of my advice is I'm, I'm, I'm really big on the rest ethic as part of your work ethic. You need yep. to take sabbaticals and vacations and time off. I think it's really essential. So, so I don't want to discount the idea of chilling out, but in terms of trying things, um, I, I think, um, you know, uh, I, I guess I am, I'm not that competitive in that service and I, and I don't really need to, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with oftentimes good enough and things that are not perfect. And that's another piece of advice is, you know, things don't need to be perfect to be wonderful, mm -hmm. especially weddings and things like that. So, so, so I think that that helps a little bit for, because I think some people where they're trying, they're maybe frustrated because what they're producing isn't very good or um, they haven't gotten very far in acquiring the skill or whatever. And, and I seem to be a little bit more content in not optimizing everything right away and not yeah. um, having to, and, you know, and being okay with not being very good at it. Yeah. So I think, that might be one bit of advice for those who are setting off on something new, which is, you know, really lower your standards as to, um, you know, just, just tell yourself I'm learning this. I'm, uh, it's not that I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a beginner. I'm, I'm a learner and um, it's perfectly fine if I don't even get any further than this. Yeah. So that might be one thing that I might suggest. Absolutely. I love that too, because we live in such an instant gratification world nowadays mm -hmm. where we love to give up at the first sign of mm -hmm. trouble and we never yeah. want to see it come into fruition. And I've heard you speak about how some of the best projects that we do, you give yourself a five-year time horizon to even mm -hmm. see them come in, mm -hmm. into reality. I think that's a great approach to take because right, right, right. a lot of people yeah. will say not even 90 days and they'll give up. Right, um, right. Take the long view. I mean, yeah. I, I'm reminded by most of the talking about influencers a lot of the YouTubers like Mr. Beast and others will talk about mm -hmm. the fact that, um, yeah, nothing happened until after their 100th yeah. video that they uploaded. Um, they uploaded a hundred of them just because they wanted to before anything happened. And so, yeah. um, so the, 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 their, their, their bar was very low. Um, <laughs> and, and they kept going. And I think, you know, um, I think that's sort of part of it is, is, is as you said, is this kind of a, I often say that, you know, success is almost indistinguishable from patience in a lot of cases yeah. uh, that you really, I mean, if you want success, but that's the other thing is I think I'm, I'm a really good hobbyist because I have lots of hobbies where I'm not looking for success from it. I'm doing it because there's a pleasure and an interest on its own whether or not it ever yields something that looks like success. Yeah. And partly that's kind of redefining for me what I mean by success. And yeah. um, there is uh, maybe a sense in a lot of young people of this kind of dire yearning or grasping for success with a big capital S. Yes. And if they, can't get it in, like you said, 90 days, then they're going to do something else. And, and um, one of my bits, bits of advice is, is that you should really try and work on something for some period of life that looks nothing like success. That's, that's the opposite of that, that it's, that it's obviously unprofitable and obviously unsuccessful and obviously crazy or stupid or unusually weird. And that's will later on become something that you can return to that, that experience, but I, I, I think, um, I wouldn't say I'm anti-success, but I'm, I think letting that become too much of a driver, actually, it's, it's like, it's like trying to get rich. It's yeah. not, if you try to get rich directly, it just doesn't work. You have to see that wealth as a byproduct of what you're doing. And I think success would almost be the same thing. Success almost needs to be a byproduct of something else that you're doing. I mean, you're doing for other reasons and that will lead you to success, but that's not your, should not be your goal. Yeah. And I think a lot of young people too, when you say su success with a capital S, they'll put two lines through that S because they <laughs> yeah, think exactly. of success 
and money is is interchangeable as terms. Right, right, right. I think it's primarily because money is one of the only actual measurable forms of, if you want to call it success, of course, money is important and you can see how much money somebody has, but it's not everything. And yeah, you could measure your blood pressure or your resting heart rate as measurables, but people don't value health and relationships the same way that they do, they do money, but you've said it in your book and I've seen it time and time again, that money is not the answer in terms of finding every single ounce of joy that you want to have in life. Uh, There are other aspects to it and you have to explore around um, and truly break away from this notion uh, in order to find them. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy that you promote that in your work because I, I yeah. think that's so crucial. Yeah, yeah, you were saying you, you often, what's really odd is I, you know, I've had the privilege of hanging around people who are very successful financially. And it's yeah. really interesting because you don't see their success. I mean, it's like if someone has a billion dollars, they've got a billion times or at least a million <laughs> times as much money as you but their clothes are not a million times better yeah where they're eating they're not it's not a million times better food um their house is actually not even a million times better so 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 um you it 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 doesn't really even those zeros don't even really increase your happiness or joy by those same zeros yeah sometimes they're quite the opposite they can actually become a burden so yeah, so I think, um, I, I think what what I find exciting these days is the um, the young people and people who are trying to basically invent new definitions of success, and I think that might be one of the one that to me would be an inc- incredibly lovely goal for somebody. Yeah. So my goal is to invent a new definition of success. And that would be a very thrilling thing to see. And, and, and yeah. that would be a person that I would follow. I, I would too. And I think that ties <laughs> very well into one of your best parables, which is don't right. be the best, be the only. Which, right. which I love that parable. And I've listened to you talk about this book a lot. And I love that everyone focuses on different parables, but this is the one that everybody resonates with because it's so yeah, true. Exactly. But it's, it's so, so hard, yeah, to to truly capture, and it is. especially being young, trying to figure out who you are yourself. You don't even truly understand who who you are. But the kind of <laughs> catch twenty two is to that is that you never will. You will never have an a hundred percent perspective on who you truly are. You'll only ever see a certain percentage of yourself because you're not putting yourself in every single environment that you can to see how you would react in different environments. And when you're trying to be the only. A lot of people will confuse that saying, okay, I need to niche down so heavily that I am the best at specializing in this one area. Mm -hmm. But I think what gets confused is that you can be really good in one area and then really good in another. And as a whole encompassing view of yourself, you're the only person who has all these experiences, which I think is a really cool definition of how you can define your own success is you can be really good at writing and then you're a really good family person and you're a really good friend and you're able to plan all these amazing events and stuff like that. That's really cool to me. I love that you promote that message. And I, I just want to see how how did you come to that conclusion for yourself? Because I, when I talked about how much you do, I, I didn't mean to paint you as a workaholic. I, I loved how much you spend your free time with your family trying mm-hmm, new mm-hmm, things that mm-hmm. provide you with a sense of joy. Was this something that later on in adulthood you had to really come – and find within you? Or was it something mm-hmm. that just over time throughout your travels, throughout your experiences, you realize to yourself, I really am just one of one. Yeah. I, I, um, I think I am temperamentally, you know, very mellow and optimistic and, um, not afraid of much. Yeah. So, um, but, but, but I, you know, m- as I imagined my, cause I'm probably not very ambitious either. And as I imagined my, my future when I was young, I was sort of signing up for a very, um, you know, I would say, um, poor, you know, not having very much money, having, trying to make things myself. I was a big doer yourself. So I was kind mm-hmm. of imagining this sort of self-sufficient and everybody that I saw was like that did not have very much money. So I thought <laughs> well, that's probably what I'll look like. Maybe yeah. a lot of books and, you know, um, and uh, I didn't have any idea what I would do for money, but I was not really concerned about money. 
I was concerned about some other things. And so I think I didn't know what those are. I didn't make a list and saying, well, you know, number one is going to be family and stuff. I, I didn't even know if I'd ever marry. I didn't really have any girlfriends and stuff. So there was, that wasn't really in my calculation. Hmm. It was more of, um, it was sort of like, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to aim for anything but money. You know, <laughs> All these other things, quality time, art, um, you know, um, contemplation. So it's sort of like, I'll take any other value except mm-hmm. going after money. And so yeah. the fact that I have some money now is just complete accident and luck and not anything that I either really, you know, aimed for or, um, was expecting. And so, mm-hmm. um, so I think that, um, maybe that's, simply the the answer is is the, these other things almost <laughs> you know it's like almost anything else is valuable to, yeah. to, to aim for and and i think if you um aren't ambitious and you want to spend time with people and trying to be the best friend you could be or, or the best volunteer uh, you know i think those are great ingredients for a very fulfilling life maybe to answer your question shortly is i was after kind of a, a full life I think from from the beginning, I was after a full life where it seemed rich to me. And so I, when I would meet someone who seemed to have a rich life to me, I would look at their lives and say, what is it about their life that I find attractive? Yeah. And it wasn't about how much money you have. It was about, you know, how much they could read or it was about like how much art did they have in their life? It was about like, you know, what did they do with their free time? Um, how do they treat people? Those were the kinds of things that I was paying attention to. And so I think I maybe I mirrored those in my own life of trying to have a full life, yeah. uh, you know, kind of full in the, in the best sense of the word. Yeah. You and I think very similar in that way where I, I could very easily uh, being young, try to put my head down, get a, uh, a job that would require me to work right. outrageous amounts of hours for a, right. a trade of monetary benefit. Uh, but that wouldn't allow me to have great conversations like I am right now. It wouldn't allow yeah. me to spend key time with my family and friends and get, have experiences sure. that I'm going to remember forever. Um, right. And that was a trade-off that I chose to make. Some people don't choose yeah. that. And of course, it's individualized where everyone has their own path and whatever provides you with fulfillment and that full life, power to you. As long as you're not hurting anybody, that's my perspective on it. I read, a, right. I read a great book recently. It was called WA. And WA so is the WA. How do you spell it? Just W A. It's the it's the Japanese character for harmony. Okay. Um, okay. And it was all about finding balance in your life, uh, mm. and it was from the Japanese lifestyle perspective. Okay. Uh, and the author, the author, she's also in her twenties. Her name is Kaki Okumura. She she's amazing. I interviewed her not too long ago, and she has four key pillars to life, and it's uh, nourishment, movement, socialization, and then the fourth one, which we keep talking about, is rest, and having mm. a really good rest ethic. I think it's that fourth pillar that throws everyone out of balance where Mm -hmm. we try to balance the three of them between exercising, going to work, eating correctly, trying to socialize with our friends, and then we'll give ourselves no time to rest. Mm -hmm. Um, And just hearing her perspective and reading the book, it's really helped me bring everything into perspective on how important taking this time to recharge and try different things creatively, not necessarily sleep more, which I think a lot of people can confuse rest with, but just try new things creatively. It, it's soul feeding to me and allows me this fulfillment. Uh, and I'm glad that we agree on that because I, I think it's key, especially for young people. Yeah. That you have a lot of good perspectives in the book. I want to get into a lot of them. Uh, just cover sure. some of them. There's 450. <laughs> so the, the book is an incredible read. It it can be an incredibly long read if you choose to be, which I think is really cool. You can look at the book. You can ponder upon a parable for uh, hours and just think about how mm-hmm. it impacts your life. And these are some of the ones that I, I wanted to highlight. Uh, this first one, I I thought about this in a more abstract perspective. I'm interested to hear your answer. It's when an object is lost, 95% of the time, it's hiding within arm's reach of where it was last seen. Search in all possible locations in the radius and you'll find it. This one I took, not in the literal sense, but I've heard you talk so much about how imagination is key uh, yeah. to finding joy. And it made me think of how at a certain age, we lose that childlike wonder and that imagination and we know that it is in arm's reach, mm-hmm. but we're scared to recapture it. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. How did you I, I think, recapture it? Yeah. 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 I, I, I think you're absolutely, I, I meant that though, of course, in the literal sense of, yeah. I'm in my household known as Mr. Find It because I will find the things that people <laughs> misplace and they're usually exactly nearby. But there is another another bit of advice that I have in the book, which is you know, the thing that made you weird as a kid can make you great as an adult if you don't lose it. So there is yeah. is this idea that of um, some of the answers that we have and directions are actually very nearby and we just don't see them. Um, and, and I think that is, I think that is true, um, that the, um, you know, recapturing our kind of childlike imagination, which, um, most kids have, and they have it because they don't know, um, how things work and that they have an expectations that they, they, they haven't kind of grasped the, 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 the general, um, consensus on the world yeah. and, and I, in my own work with doing scenarios and working with people in blue sky, um, you know, creative projects, it is so, so hard or the hardest part about getting people to kind of imagine things is, is, is not the imagine, not the, 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 um, the reaching out or, or going somewhere. It's, it's the fact that they're constrained by what they know. We, we did something at Wired where we asked people to try to predict the future. We asked experts, like a dentist experts, like what's the future of dentistry? And then we also asked people who are not in dentistry about the future of it. And we, we had actually years that we marked and those years are now behind us. And someone did an analysis of it and the, 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 the best predictors were not any of the experts. <laughs> they were the people outside because the experts knew too much. They knew how difficult these other things were going to be. Like there's yeah. someone. I remember there was like laser fillings or laser, um, yeah, something like laser fillings, laser drilling, and the experts they knew too much. They were constrained by what everybody knew and about all the problems. Whereas the the um, the unexperts, the lay people, were, uh, were 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 liberated by not knowing, and yeah. that not. Knowing that child, like not knowing the answer, is really an essential element in you know being an imaginative, and it's the same thing that I think we were talking about. It's like when when you when you're looking for things, you sometimes know too much, and you're too sophisticated to kind of look nearby and to things in your own vicinity, your yeah. own past, your own abilities, and you're kind of reaching for grander things, bigger, more sophisticated answer. And um, it's easy to overlook um, the things because you kind of know too much. And so you have to do the beginner's mind. You have to kind of unlearn things. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a lot of what learning new things is, is actually the unlearning of the old things. Yeah. There, there's certainly a, a lot of instances where we can be too smart for our own good. When you're yeah. saying that story, it made me think of a, a more <laughs> a simple model of people who are p trying to pick like the college basketball tournament, like the March Madness, right. and you'll right. get all the experts trying to say, oh, I know Kansas is going far this year. Meanwhile, the person who picks the, the school with the coolest colors is going gonna, is gonna to end up with a better bracket just because it, <laughs> it, it's, it's just more, it's just easier. They're not trying to overanalyze everything. And w people love to overanalyze. I overanalyze constantly. It's one of my worst habits. I'm an overanalyzer yeah. and a perfectionist. And right. Those, especially yeah, they, yeah. The, the, in the right in the right times, those can be really very valuable qualities. But there are times when you, um, you know, you want to ship. You know, the perfect is the enemy of the of the done. So yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So the, so it has a role, and I think that's part of what you know, maybe part of what success is about is is about learning to balance those, learning to when to. Um, when to indulge them and when, when to turn them on and when to turn them off. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, some, for some people, perfectionism, um, can be a liability for sure. Oh yeah. Uh, for me too. Or, uh, producing this podcast, for example, uh, I try to think of the perfect questions I can ask you that I, mm -hmm. I haven't ha heard you answer before. Um, mm -hmm. and if I, maybe my delivery is a bit off, I'll be thinking about it for the next five minutes while I'm trying to answer the next question. That can be a liability. Uh, but right. in terms of trying to produce high quality content, I think being a perfectionist can help where uh, sure. I think it holds me to a higher standard. 
uh, I think where it really hindered me was when I was first trying to get going and I was trying to overanalyze every single thing that I was doing, like, okay, this needs to be the perfect time to get started or I can't do it. Um, and another one of the parables, at which I took more abstract is just don't wait for the storm to pass, just dance in the rain where right. I don't think the timing's ever going to be perfect nope. for anybody. I think you just need to get out there and get going. Right. That's the key. Uh, is if you never start and you just overanalyze every single aspect that could be by the time you're ready to start, uh, you'll have to analyze a couple more aspects because the times sure. have changed a little bit and you'll just have right. to keep going through the cycle. It's just it's right. just a game that you play with yourself. Yeah, um, one of the things yeah. that I have noticed with people's own trajectories and careers is that it doesn't really matter where you start. It's not going to be anywhere near where you ended. So you don't want to get too hung up on where you start. Yeah. And um kind of want to start somewhere where you can, you know, master something where you can kind of really get going. And then from there, you, you can kind of keep creeping towards somewhere that's more you ish and more um, closer to your talents. But yeah. don't get hung up on where you begin. I agree. A, lo a lot of people like to think of life as a game. Um, and it, it ties in again to another parable where uh, finite games are played to win or lose. Mm -hmm. Infinite games are played to keep the game going. Seek out right. infinite games because they yield unlimited results. I love that one. And immediately it made me think of how when we take the game of life, not, not the actual board game, but like the game right. of life, the figurative, people love to view it as a finite game because our life on yeah. earth is finite. Right. How do you go about trying to play the game of life as if it were an infinite game and just keep experiencing new things? Well, I... I um one way which is you know you you actually have a lot of choice no matter where you live whether it's a privileged place like living in california or living in india or living in nigeria yeah. wherever it might be you have a lot of you still have a lot of choice in the kind of people that you are going to be around and um you i i gravitate to those who are playing the infinite games themselves Mm -hmm. So basically, if someone is playing a finite game, I just I'm not going to play in their game if yeah. I can at all help it. And so, um, so you, so I would say seek out places where other people are playing the infinite game because part of the infinite game is that you want as many people to play as possible for as yeah. long as possible, and they will generally um, invite you in. And so. Um, Again, this I think applies in my own experience to everywhere in the world. You know, you could be a very, very poor person, but there might be somebody in your neighborhood who is open and playing the infinite game, meaning they're not in a, in a win lose situation. They're 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 interested in helping other people win, yeah. and so um, seek out those people and play with them in their game. Yeah, there are companies. The, who yeah, um who are run that way who who they're not after win lose they are trying to better the employees the customers the shareholders mm -hmm. find find them yeah what's your what's your advice for overcoming shyness because I know that holds a mm. lot of people back from taking that step to yeah. finding those people I don't know if I have any good advice about shyness I mean you know just generically as I said in one of my bits of advice most people would say that they were shy it's even even the most <laughs> i have a i have a niece who's i think one of the most extroverted people i could imagine and she claims that she's shy so it's like yeah. all right she feels that and i think everybody does and i would say that's the first thing i would say is <laughs> everybody is shy or thinks that they're shy yeah. and so um that's okay. And the, the overcoming is you, they are also shy and, and, and they're like you waiting for someone else to make the first move. Yeah. And everybody's waiting for the first move. And so um, you can kind of rest in that knowing that if you make a first move, they're going to be relieved. They're going to thank you. They're going to be happy. Yeah. They may not all to say that and you'll get rejected. And, but that's, I guess the thing about shyness, maybe I would say, is you can't take the refusal personally. Absolutely. Is is that um, most cases, it's not about you personally. It's all the other things going on in a person's life. We only see 2% of yeah. most people. There's just a lot going on. And so um, 
if you are rejected or turned down or turned back or whatever it is or ignored, which is more likely, um, uh, don't take it personally. It's it's just uh, it's just a uh, it's an opportunity to try again. Absolutely, that's the best way to take it. It's going to happen every time you apply for a job. You know, you won't hear yeah. back sometimes when that resume goes out. Um, just trying to cold email people to start business with them right. it happens all the time. And one of those key things in life that rejection happens all the time is love. And I think now more than ever, young people have a strained relationship with love, yeah. and they're they're afraid. Uh, yeah. of getting their hearts broken and getting into it, but it can be one of the most beautiful things that could ever happen in your life. Sure, um, of course. More, in, more intimate question. Uh, how did you meet your wife and why did you fall in love? Yeah, I met my wife who was a, a recent immigrant, basically. She grew up in Taiwan. She came to the United States as a graduate student. Um, and I met her shortly after she arrived from Taiwan with... Um, uh, you know, um, not very good English. And I uh, met her at a dinner for international students. I was involved with the mm -hmm. international student uh, system at the University of Georgia where I was working. And I met her at a party there. And um, we weren't dating, but we did communicate over time because she left shortly thereafter. She transferred to San Francisco University of California Medical Center where she was which was a better fit for her, yeah. her, um, her major. And, um, so we didn't really, so we occasionally corresponded, but, um, we didn't really get, uh, get together until I happened to come to San Francisco for my job at whole earth. And that's where we kind of reconnected. So, um, I would say it was, uh, a very, we we courted. We actually didn't even date at first. <laughs> we uh, courting is when you uh, get together with someone else, but not as a couple alone. You do it with other people. Yeah. That was that was kind of from the the Christian background. Is you you court, meaning that you you're you're with you're on a date with other people. So you so there's more more interesting dynamics. There's not the kind of the the pressure of having a kind of romantic thing of, of a date. And um, uh, as, I've, as I've told people before, we, we, yeah, we, we eventually got engaged and then we actually eventually, then we broke up, we broke the engagement off. And so um, it was only much later in a very long story that we actually got back together again. So it was, it was a, not a smooth or straight line, yeah. which is like a lot of life. Um, there's lots of things going on. So, um, and now we've been married for 35 years. So wow. that's pretty good. Congratulations. Yeah. And that's, that's one of those things that we talked about earlier where when the, when, when the going gets tough nowadays, people run away, but yeah. they'll never, they'll never try to capture it again. And yeah, it's yeah. Led to so 30, we, 35 years of beautiful marriage and three beautiful kids. Yep, <laughs> and exactly. you said one of your only regrets is that you didn't have more. Yeah. Um, that's that's true. Uh, yeah. you know, my wife works full time. She's still, in fact, she's at work right now. I'm going to go pick her up. But um, we had you know, we both had full time job and full time with three kids, full time mom working. Uh, fourth would have been pretty tough, but we <laughs> were were willing to do it. Yeah. Um, if we could have had, it, we just weren't able to. So, um, uh, yeah, that's you know, this is kind of beyond things. I don't know people in their own backgrounds but I, I do encourage people to have as many kids as they possibly can because they won't have any regrets for those that Absolutely. they have yeah one, one of the uh envisionments of my full life is having as many kids as i can um, sure and just well, be, be hope, like, yeah, yeah find a partner who's willing and that's <laughs> uh, that's part of the deal absolutely um, yeah and um yeah so so there's i mean just on that subject, there is absolutely 100% no overpopulation problem. So don't even let that enter <laughs> into someone's calculation. Yeah, I've, I've, I could do a whole podcast talking about all, all the research you've done on that. And I, I wish yeah. I could pick your brain on that, but maybe another day. Um, just everything that you've said so far about just being the best holistic person that you can and just making the most impact on the ones that you love and the ones that you have in your life. I, I think it really talks about 
this idea of being a good ancestor that you focus on a lot, mm-hmm. where you start mm-hmm. with the people who are here with you and you pass mm-hmm. it down. And I, f- I hear a lot of people nowadays talk about that they want to make an impact on the world at a grand scale. Mm-hmm. And of course, I think that ambition is great, but I also love to focus on impacting someone's world where you can mm-hmm. make the maximum about it, amount of impact on someone's life. And if you're trying to be a good ancestor, do the most that you can to pass forward on to the people that are mm-hmm. going to come next in, in your lineage. Do you think there's a balance that you have to walk between trying to impact the world and impact somebody's world? Or is it something that you don't even con- consciously think about? You're just trying to do the best that you can. Yeah, I, I think it's very hard to do both Yeah, at the same time. You know, um, someone like, say, Elon Musk is very... Uh, it has been very good and is really reaching to try and impact as many people positively as he can. Mm-hmm. Yet at the same time, his own personal life is a complete shambles. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, so, um, so, so, so I'm not confident that, that, that you can do both equally well. Yeah. I think just some kind of, I think there has to be a trade off, you know, I mean, Again, Gandhi certainly impacted the world in many ways, and his life is also his personal life is also pretty crazy and weird too. So, mm-hmm. um, so there's there's a way in which they can be beneficial to the world at large and not treat the people around them necessarily in an elevated way. And um, I think we might, you know, we might have to make those kinds of a choice. Uh, certainly, there's some kind of compromise when you can be very good to the people and still try and do something big. Mm -hmm. But that bigness and that scale of it has a cost. It's sort of what I say. Yeah. I I think greatness is sort of overrated and greatness is in some ways almost like a great people. The people who are great, they're extreme. They're they're extreme at both poles. And that extremity is not necessarily something we want to imitate. So, so, um, in my experience of meeting the great people, they're intensely flawed. Yeah. And it's that flawness that's built into their greatness because they're kind of ex- at the extreme. Yeah. And so, um, so I don't necessarily recommend that people aim for greatness. I aim think that's a hard, only, that's a hard truth. Yeah. Right. And, uh, um, yeah. And so that, that kind of like affecting the whole world is, um, you're an out, you're definitely an outlier and definitely going to pay a cost. And sometimes that cost is around the people that are around you. Yeah. Um, All you have to do is read one biography of, of someone who's exactly uber, uber famous, like, uber wealthy. Warren Buffett. And yeah. Here's a, here's a guy who, you know, he's a great investor, but he's not a great dad. Yeah. Okay. And so you kind of, kind of pick, which one you want to be. And you can be a little bit of both for sure. But you're, um, so anyway, I don't think greatness, I I don't recommend seeking greatness. I I would honestly say the same thing. I don't, I don't think it's a a necessity as as to quote unquote, winning the game of life. And I think you can, you can be a great dad. You could be a great community member. You could be great in a whole lot of things, but you don't have to be great on the grandest of scales. Um, And 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 for most of us, for most of us, our, our, our names will be completely forgotten in four generations. Another harsh reality, but very true. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and that concludes Buffett. And, yeah. um, uh, but, but we can have influence, impact over the long term by you know, indirectly yeah. by the kind of people that we are surrounding ourselves by our own family. If we have children and grandchildren, they can kind of ripple through. And so we can have a long-term effect, but it's very, very indirect. Yeah. And it's kind of a softer power, so to speak. Yeah. And so, so I do think we can have effect on the long-term, but only in a very indirect way, in a kind of a soft way. I 100% agree with you. I think that's very profound. And I hope that other people my age can be as forward-thinking uh-huh. as that, uh, which I think we struggle at, is we're very short-sighted where we have this love of ourselves that I think dominates our view right now. Um, we're addicted to uh, social media likes, getting validation, 
and trying to build up our status in the world. And uh, we, we're not as forward thinking as we should be as to uh, mm -hmm. what really constitutes living a full life um, and realizing that in two, three generations that nobody cares how many likes you got on your Instagram post mm -hmm. a couple days ago. And right. It's harsh, but it's very true. Th this has been great. I want to end off with just some rapid questions, uh, just sure curiosities that I have. Um, a couple more parables and just a couple more just general questions. Uh, one parable that I loved was art is what you leave out. Uh, <laughs> what'd you leave out of the book? Was there any advice that oh, you yeah. got was just the worst? <laughs> well, it wasn't that there was a worst, um, but there was a, there were a lot of advice, vices, whatever bits that were left on the cutting floor. Some of which I've been reposting now yeah. um, on a daily basis. Those are actually not in the book. I mean, I'm reposting them because Penguin Viking, the publishers of the book, mm -hmm. were really freaked out by me with the idea of me publishing anything in the book. So I've been posting things that weren't in the book. Yeah. Um, so there are there were ones that that there were, I mean I have pages and pages and books and books full of things that I didn't feel were up to snuff that were yeah. either not condensed enough, not surprising enough, not important enough, not practical mm -hmm. enough. That was a real thing. I was really trying to aim for things that were actionable in some capacity. Yeah. And so um, so yeah, what I left out was a lot of other stuff. And I spent most of my time reducing the number of words. And so there was all these, I mean, a lot of these things, as you said, you, you know, you can unpack and they can be a big lesson. And yeah. what I left out was all the things that we're talking about here. And <laughs> so um, um, I, I very deliberately spent most of my time leaving out words and stuff and to have this kind of essence, this capsulation, this distillation. And that is true for painters which is really about knowing when to stop and what not keep it out of the frame and you know when you're writing dialogue in a screenplay or a movie the real art is in all the things that you don't have the character say yeah. there's actually a lot more gaps between things than most amateur writers would allow they they'd have all kinds of stuff in between um so yeah so that 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 leaving out is the editing process when you're yeah. when you're editing pictures it's throwing good ones away just so you have the the essential ones and yeah i think it's a lot of art what i was thinking about with the book is how it's so similar to poetry and yes. how i know when you were biking across america you wrote haikus and it, right. i just thought of the structure of the haiku and how it's how you word everything and you have to pack so much into such short syllables yeah. such short phrases uh that i really admired that and when, when i'm reading or i'm viewing art i always love to pick out the little details and i wasn't sure if this was your choice or maybe it was the publishers i was just interested to know when looking at the pages of the book there are certain pages that just has one parable on it other pages yeah. have multiple parables on it was that your choice or was that something that just happened well so one of my bits of advice is to prototype things so i actually <laughs> did multiple prototypes of the book were actually made books that were printed oh, very and cool. I designed the pages with the numbers. The, the prototype book actually had doodles that I made huh. in, in, in the book, which um, the only publishers doing are the Italian version. They, the U S ones didn't, didn't want them, but to, to answer your question, I designed the pages and the, and the um, number of things they did not keep that exact, design but i gave them guidance on the ones that would want to be alone and the ones that would um, work with two and so there was kind of um some priorities so yeah. there was i would say have to say there was a co-design i didn't get to design every page on this version but i had some guidelines about which ones would kind of stand alone and and things like that so yeah. um there was not a hundred percent control, but there was some control over that. Um, That's awesome. The, yeah. The version that I have, um, I did go through everyone and choose the exact location of those. That's very cool. I'm glad that you had that kind of creative control. I, I've heard yeah. from authors before that they kind of lose that control, especially when they hand it over to the publisher. Well, they, they do. It's, again, I didn't have total control. <laughs> 
and I had, you know, I didn't have total control about the cover and other kinds of things. And that's part of the deal. When you go with a New York publisher, you have to sign up for that. Yeah. Um, but there's certainly a, a back and forth and, um, you know, you have people in sales who have sell a lot of books and I've learned to, to listen to them. I don't have to obey them, but I will listen to them and we'll come to some compromise. And that's, yeah. that's how you do with projects where you have collaboration. Absolutely. Compromise is always key. Um, right. 100%. Last question I have for you is uh, you talk about trying to live a full life and trying to become your full self. Do you have any idea what's left for you on your journey to becoming your full self? Do you have any idea of any uh, maybe projects or stuff that you want to do? Or do you think the, the beauty is in the unknown? No, I, 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 I have spoken elsewhere about, you know, having five year project and I'm on a five year project next which is imagining the hundred year future that I want to live in. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether it's a book or a movie or a game. I have no idea right now. Um, but that's, that's, that's my next five year project. And um, beyond that, I actually don't have uh, one because I don't have these grand plans. I usually I have a bunch of other things that I'm working on like yeah. my YouTube channel, and maybe that becomes something. So so I, I'd like to kind of iterate towards um, keep prototyping and making versions and seeing what works and what kind of feedback there is. Um, yeah. I did a graphic novel, um, and we may return to do a sequel to that. So that could be another project. So um, I don't know. I, 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 I am interested in more speculation and fiction in that sense like the science fiction the hundred year project is a kind of speculations um i feel that um trying to keep up with like ai is like a full-time job that yeah. i don't know if i'm ready you know because we're just starting on the ai the AI is just starting and it's going to run even faster and i don't know if i can just really if i want to just try and keep up for the next five or ten years yeah. but um trying to do something more imaginative, more in the speculation, I think is something where I'm headed. So to answer your question, I think I am headed in a direction where maybe there's more fiction involved, more yeah. straight imagination and less reporting. Once again, a massive thank you to Kevin for joining me for today. Such an incredible person, such an interesting guy who has such a great perspective on the world. I can't thank him enough for taking the time to sit down with me. If you enjoyed today's conversation and you want to see even more incredible conversations going forward, please follow along, leave a rating. It really is the best way to help grow the show. I can't thank you enough for being a supporter. Until next time, I'll see you.